The Lord be with you. I am Jenny Ellis. I am the interim pastor here at First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to welcome you, um, each of you, including the families of some of the children that we'll see processing in with palms in a few moments. Um, I wanted uh, to, that we would light the peace candle, which is lit as we pray for peace in this world and in our community and in our lives. We always have a peace candle lit in our worship services because the world needs our prayers for peace. So I invite you at home and wherever you are to pray for peace. Now, please join me as we gather in the presence of God in our responsive call to worship. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Even now your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey. We see him come today. Hosanna. Our processional hymn is number 196, which you can uh, see in, in our hymn books or up on the wall. I invite you to stand with us in body or in spirit as the children and the choir enter the sanctuary with palms. Let us join in singing. <laughs>
I invite you to be seated. You. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks, Carol. Um, our first, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to lean over because I can't get it undone. So our first song is going to be presented to us by the St. Pete Primary School. Uh, and Ashley Hardy will be directing them. Are we ready? Next song, we are really fortunate here at First Presbyterian Church. We have a small choir called the Joyful Noise Music Makers under the direction of Barbara Brownlee, and we're really grateful to her and Dietra Flora for being their accompanist, and now they are going to sing a song about a donkey. The Joyful Noise Music Makers would like to share with you this, this song called The Donkey Dilemma. The song begins with the, donkey, the little donkey saying, Why me? He thinks he is too small to carry Jesus. As Jesus enters Jerusalem, many of the people are happy waving palm prawns, singing Hosanna to their king. But not everyone was happy to have Jesus as their king. They wanted him to die. So the little donkey rides on to Calvary where Jesus dies on the cross. Yet the story doesn't end there because Jesus rises from the lonely tomb. Easter is coming soon.
the, the children will be headed downstairs to the fellowship hall for activities. If any of the parents here are new to the church, you may want to follow the group down to see where your children are, but also to let us know about any special needs your children may have. We are so glad to have you and your children here with us today. Oh, and I think I'm supposed to say that there were some Easter eggs that had some weird things in them. So if your kids got Easter eggs, uh, look in and see and make sure you want your kids to put those things in their mouths. <laughs> I greet you as well with joy and hope that you are well and uh, that you feel the love of this church as we reach out to you. Blessings, my dear.
smaller squish. Let's move down a little bit.
Let us come in prayer as we come for the prayer of illumination. As you lead us in the right paths for your name's sake, O Shepherd God, send your spirit to open our minds and hearts for the journey before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We turn now to the Palm Sunday story, the story of the triumphal entry Jesus made into Jerusalem, reading from the Gospel of Mark, Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in highest heaven. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. What I will be sharing with you today is a sermon that I call Martha's Story. And Martha is not the sister of Mary that we know about, Mary and Martha. This is a different Martha, some run-of-the-mill Martha that introduced herself to me some years ago. And now I will share her story with you. Jesus of Nazareth, you are asking me about the Galilean. Well, yes, I can tell you about him. It was a long time ago, of course. I may be old now, but I remember. I remember as if it were only yesterday. We lived in a village outside Jerusalem, Reuben and I, with our children. We had our own house. It was a small house, but it had a room up on the flat roof. They called that an upper room. Some houses had them. And I had some flowers in pots up there near the upper room. They reminded me of my old home out in the country. You know, it's nice to be reminded of the old days. Our house was not a large house or fancy, but it was large enough for us with Reuben's mother who lived with us then and Joseph and Deborah, our children, my friends, who would gather with me by the well, liked to tease me about being rich because we had that upper room and a donkey. But we weren't rich at all, not then, <laughs> and not now. <laughs> oh, I I'm sorry, you wanted to know about Jesus, the Galilean. I had heard of him. Everyone had heard of him. Roman soldiers talked about him. 
Travelers coming to the well talked about him. Traders bringing caravans into the city. Everyone was talking about the Galilean rabbi. At first, it was just a story here and there, you know, about someone attracting crowds, a new rabbi up there in the hills. They said he was healing blind people. You don't heal blind people, but that's what they said. And he was helping lames, lame people to walk. And they said he was casting out demons. So yes, we had heard about Jesus. Everyone had heard about Jesus. But we had even seen him once. It was the time we took Reuben's mother up to see Aunt Sarah and Uncle Simeon. And people in the village were excited. They were saying the rabbi Jesus was out on the hillside with his disciples. Our Joseph was just a little boy, about seven. And he was excited too. Come on, mother, he said, let's go. Everyone's going, let's go too. So we went. The whole village seemed to be going. I guess we were all curious, wondering what this teacher was like. We sort of hoped we'd see something miraculous, demons running into the lake. <laughs> or maybe a mountain being moved a little way, you know? Or thousands of us fed by one loaf of bread. <laughs> we were so curious and eager. We were all headed out there to the hills, chattering and laughing and wondering what we would see. And sure enough, when we got there, we saw that he was on the hillside with a huge crowd gathered around, and there were children everywhere running about and laughing. And the people, the adults, had gathered up close so they could hear what he was saying as he taught. And I thought it was kind of funny because here we were out in the sun on a hillside, but we were acting like we were in a synagogue. The men sat over on one side and we women had hung back, but we all gathered and sat together on the other side, just like we did in the synagogue. You know, it was really amazing. Most of us had just come out of curiosity just to see who this Jesus was and to see what was going on. But here he was sitting on a rock and talking about God. He was talking about what he called the kingdom of heaven. Now maybe Reuben and I were not what you might call religious, but we did keep the Jewish laws and we observed the Sabbath and we also kept all the festivals. We gave alms to the poor as much as we were able. So I considered us to be faithful Jewish family. I, I hope you understand that. But on that day, out here on the hillside, Jesus was talking about God. And it was as if God was really there. I don't know how that could be. Maybe in the sunlight all around or in the breeze against our faces or maybe in the crowds of people, but I could feel a power, a presence that I had never felt before, not even in the synagogue. Well, or maybe it was just all the excitement. But then the things Jesus said, he was calling God Abba, like your words, Papa, or daddy. Talking about being religious was more than keeping the laws and more than being at synagogue on the Sabbath. Like being faithful to God had something to do with actually knowing God. As if the laws weren't enough. As if maybe religion touched your whole life. Well, we walked silently back to Aunt Sarah's that day. The children ran on ahead, and we grown-ups were thinking our own thoughts as we walked along. I don't know about the others, but I felt, I felt as if I had been changed somehow on that day, as if out there on that hillside I had really seen God for the first time ever. And as if I 
had become new. Well, the feeling, that feeling was both happy and sad. It was joyful and confused. I wanted to hear more, uh, and then again, I didn't. I don't know. I, I hope you can understand a little of how that might have felt. But then in a day or two, we went home, back to Jerusalem, back to our lives. And after that, I began to listen for news about Jesus, the Galilean. When I went to the well, I would hope someone would have something to tell. Or in the market, as we looked over the fish or the grain, maybe someone would have a story to tell about. And we did hear about Jesus of Nazareth more and more as the days went on. People he'd healed, towns he'd visited, synagogues where he had preached, stories he had told. And when he raised that man Lazarus from the dead, all of Jerusalem was talking about it. Already four days in the tomb, and Jesus called him back to life. Lazarus, come out, he said. And the dead man came walking out of the tomb. And then Jesus told the other men, unbind him and let him go. Right, that's what he said. Unbind him and let him go. Easy. Matter of fact, as if it wasn't a miracle, it happened all the time. But people don't raise dead men all the time. There was something really special about Jesus, something amazing, that's for sure. But you know, come to think of it, it was after the stories about Lazarus that the other talk began, some scary talk. People began to say that the Galilean named Jesus was a sorcerer, an imposter, or worse, that he claimed to be God. That was the worst crime of all. And many of us common people thought that the priest must be afraid of Jesus. That's what we thought, afraid of the crowds that followed him wherever he went. And then the Roman soldiers laughed at all this talk. To him, to them, the affairs of us Jews seemed trivial and foolish. But it wasn't trivial at all. After all, Passover was approaching. It was our most important feast. I'm sure you know about Passover. That's the time we remember the deliverance of our people from Egypt, from slavery. And when the Lord God killed the firstborn sons of Egypt to free the people of Israel, the angel of death passed over our houses because the blood of a lamb was smeared on the doorposts. The Lamb's blood and the power of God saved our people. So every year we Jews celebrate the Passover, and many come to Jerusalem to observe Passover at the Holy Temple. Well, the speculation was that this year Jesus and his disciples were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. We hoped it wasn't true. The tension in the air was incredible and it became dangerous to talk about Jesus of Nazareth, to ask about him, to appear interested if someone else was talking about him. And word went out that good, self-respecting Jews would not offer hospitality to someone like Jesus. It was really tense that year, tense as we approached our most joyful, most reverent feast as we approached Passover. Oh, excuse me, I, I was remembering. Jesus came to Jerusalem, all right. Even with all that dangerous talk, he came and he arrived on the first day of the week before Passover. And perhaps it would have been all right if he had just come into Jerusalem quietly, not causing a stir. But no, no, instead of coming quietly, he rode into town on a donkey, like a conquering hero, like a king. And 
Did you know it was our donkey, Reuben's and mine? I hope you understand about this. We didn't really know Jesus, except we'd heard all the stories and we'd seen him teaching that one time out on the hill. And Reuben and I had not ever even talked about him. I wasn't sure what Reuben thought about Jesus. I had hoped he hadn't sensed my feelings that day coming down from the hillside. I felt foolish enough just thinking those strange thoughts about God, about all of that. But the day those young men came to get the donkey, it was as if we knew that they were coming. Little Joseph, for some reason, had brushed the donkey down and had tied it out by the street as if we had known. It was amazing. And from inside the house, I heard Reuben asking the two dusty young men what they were doing untying our donkey. He should have been shouting. He had a temper in those days. But instead, he went up to them quickly, and he spoke quietly. What do you want of our beast, he asked. The Lord has need of it, they answered him. That was all. The Lord has need of it. So how can I explain this to you? How can I help you understand? You see, there was real fear in our village as Passover approached. There was the knowledge that Jesus of Nazareth, the teacher, the healer, was, well, maybe not really a troublemaker, but he was certainly one around whom trouble was brewing. We knew that showing an interest in him was risky, but to help him, to allow him the use of our donkey, that should have put an icy sort of fear in our hearts. I found myself thinking about our children, about Deborah and Joseph, about our peaceful lives, about our secure place in the village. But you know what else I thought of? I thought of that day on the hillside, the power we sensed there, the presence of God all around us. I had felt then that religion should touch our very lives. And now it was touching our lives. The Lord has need of it, they had said. I watched as Reuben reached out and untied the rope and handed it to the men, and then he bowed low. He didn't look at me, but he stepped back beside me in the doorway and stood with me as they led our colt away. I could feel him trembling, and I saw there were tears in his eyes, but he was standing tall and proud. The Lord had need of it, he finally said to me, and that was all. But we had been changed. And God's Passover was upon us. The Passover lamb whose blood would save the people. That Passover lamb had come and was ready. Amen. For those in the sanctuary, the offering plates will be passed. If you are worshiping online, you may give online through the church website. You may mail your check, or you may leave your offering in the mail slot at the church office. Thank you for the many ways 
you support the work of God's Church at First Presbyterian Church, St. Petersburg. Please join me in a unison prayer of dedication. O oh God, we know your gifts cannot be hoarded. They are for spending. Help us in this time of offering to share with you not only our money, but our lives also, for we are yours. In Christ's name, amen.
Let us come now in a time of prayer. O oh Lord, as we have seen the children come, as we have lifted our voices in song, as we have listened with amazement to your story, help us to watch for what will happen in the coming week. As this Jesus who has ridden triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem will now have to suffer, we ask you to help us to keep pace with him to remember the price that he paid for our sake so that when next Sunday comes, we will be prepared to watch with surprise and with joy when we hear that he has risen. As we come today to pray, we ask your healing for the sick, your comfort for all of those who grieve, your help and direction for all who, are, who have lost their way and who need a helping hand. We lift up those who are celebrating new life, new adventures, new relationships, new hopes. Lift up their joy and magnify it, O oh Lord, that they may be partners with you in all that goes on in their lives. And as we look to the world, O oh Lord, we are aware of the difficult times and places. We are aware of the horrendous shooting in Russia this week. We hear cries from Haiti and from Sudan and Ukraine and Gaza. Wherever there is need, O oh Lord, we ask your healing touch and your gift of peace. Hear the prayers that we make for ourselves, Lord, for you know the prayers we lift prayers asking for healing and help and hope and direction. Hear our prayers and hear us as we pray together the words that Jesus taught on that hillside, the prayers that Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, believe, before we leave this place, I want to remind you of the ways we will continue our worship in this coming week. On Thursday, we will gather downstairs in the fellowship hall at 5.30 for a covered dish dinner and communion around the tables. We invite you to bring a dish to share and come and join with us as we celebrate that night when Jesus observed the supper with his disciples and was betrayed and arrested. On Friday, remembering the price Jesus paid on our behalf as he hung on the cross from noon until three, this main sanctuary will be open for prayer and quiet meditation from 12 to three and you are invited to stop by as you are able. The next Sunday, we can finally rejoice in the good news of the empty tomb with an outdoor service here on the front patio at 7 and joyful services in the, in the Connect service at 9 and here in the sanctuary at 11. I invite you to please remember the one great hour of sharing, which is received at Easter time. Um, the envelopes are in the pews. That's when we... Uh, support disaster relief at home and overseas in times of hurricane or earthquake, fire, flood, famine, tornadoes, uh, many things. This is an offering that we support along with the Presbyterian Church and other denominations around the world. And finally, I remind you that there is a Stephen Minister present who will be back by the Stephen Minister banner for any who need a compassionate ear or a moment of prayer. If you need more information, please uh, check our website, look at Friday's First News, or call the church office, or ask any of us for help if you need it. Now I invite you to join me in our final hymn, number 197, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. You may stand as you are able in body or in spirit. <laughs>
like to think that Martha and her family were there in Jerusalem waving palms and singing out as Jesus entered. But I also remember that she said to us she had felt that she had been changed. And I hope that we too, in hearing the news of Jesus Christ and the story of our Savior, that we too are changed and ready to go out and make a difference in the world. So go from this place, my friend, make a difference because of what you believe, because of how God has called you, and because of who you are. Now the grace, mercy, and peace of God who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be and abide with you and all of those whom you love now and forevermore. Amen.